The Darkest Page Podcast presents Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman's The Twelfth Guest, Part 1. I don't see how it happened for my part, Mrs. Childs said. Paulina, you set the table. You counted up yesterday how many there'd be, and you said twelve. Don't you know you did, Mother? So I didn't count today, I just put on the plates, said Paulina, smiling defensively. Paulina had something of a helpless and gentle look when she smiled. Her mother was rather large, and the upper jaw full, so the smile seemed hardly under her control. She was quite pretty, her complexion was so delicate, and her eyes so pleasant. Well, I don't see how I made such a blunder, her mother remarked further as she went on pouring the tea. On the opposite side of the table were a plate, a knife and fork, and a little dish of cranberry sauce with an empty chair before them. There was no guest to fill it. It's a sign somebody's coming that's hungry, Mrs. Child's brother's wife said, with soft effusiveness, which was out of proportion to the words. The brother was carving the turkey. Caleb Childs, the host, was an old man and his hands trembled. Moreover, no one, he himself least of all, ever had any confidence in his ability in such directions. Whenever he helped himself to gravy, his wife watched anxiously lest he should spill it. And he always did. He spilled some today. There was a great spot on the beautiful clean tablecloth. Caleb set his cup and saucer over it quickly, with a little clatter because of his unsteady hand. Then he looked at his wife. He hoped she had not seen, but she had. You'd better have let John give you the gravy, she said in a stern aside. John, rigidly solicitous, bent over the turkey. He carved slowly and laboriously, but everybody had faith in him. The shoulders to which a burden is shifted have the credit of being strong. His wife, in her best black dress, sat smiling, with her head canted a little to one side. It was a way she had when visiting. Ordinarily, she did not assume it at her sister-in-law's house. But this was an extra occasion. Her fine manners spread their wings involuntarily. When she spoke about the sign, the young woman next to her sniffed. I don't take any stock in signs, she said, with a bloodness which seemed to crash through the other's airiness with such force as to almost hurt itself. She was a distant cousin of Mr. Child's. Her husband and three children were with her. Mrs. Child's unmarried sister, Maria Stone, made up the eleven at the table. Maria's gaunt face was unhealthily red about the pointed nose and the high cheekbones. Her eyes looked with a steady sharpness through her spectacles. Well, it will be time enough to believe the sign when the twelfth one comes, she said with a summary air. She had a judicial way of speaking. She had taught school ever since she was sixteen, and now she was sixty. She had just given up teaching. It was to celebrate that, and her final homecoming, that her sister was giving a Christmas dinner instead of a Thanksgiving one this year. The school had been in session during Thanksgiving week. Maria Stone had scarcely spoken when there was a knock on the outer door, which led directly into the room. They all started. They were a plain, unimaginative company, but for some reason a thrill of superstitious and fantastic expectation ran through them. No one arose. They were all silent for a moment, listening and looking at the empty chair in their midst. Then the knock came again. Go to the door, Paulina, said her mother. The young girl looked at her half fearfully, but she rose at once and went and opened the door. Everybody stretched round to see. A girl stood on the stone step looking into the room. There she stood and never said a word. Paulina looked around at her mother with her innocent, half involuntary smile. Ask her what she wants, said Mrs. Childs. What do you want? repeated Paulina, like a sweet echo. Still, the girl said nothing. A gust of north wind swept into the room. John's wife shivered, then looked around to see if anyone had noticed. 
You must speak up quick and tell what you want, so we can shut the door. It's cold, said Mrs. Childs. The girl's small, sharp face was sheathed in an old worsted hood. Her eyes glared out of it like frightened cats. Suddenly, she turned to go. She was evidently abashed by the company. Don't you want something to eat? Mrs. Childs asked, speaking louder. It ain't no matter, she just mumbled. What? She would not repeat it. She was quite off the step by this time. You make her come in, Paulina, said Maria Stone suddenly. She wants something to eat, but she's half scared to death. You talk to her. Hadn't you better come in and have something to eat, said Paulina, shyly persuasive. Tell her she can sit right down here by the stove where it's warm and have a good plate of dinner, said Maria. Paulina fluttered softly down to the stone step. The chilly snow wind came right in her sweet, rosy face. You can have a chair by the stove, where it's warm and a good plate of dinner, said she. The girl looked at her. Won't you come in, said Paulina of her own accord and always smiling. The stranger made a little hesitating movement forward. Bring her in quick and shut the door, Maria called out then, and Paulina entered with the girl stealing timidly in her wake. Take off your hood and shawl, Mrs. Child said, and sit down here by the stove and I'll give you some dinner. She spoke kindly. She was a warm-hearted woman, but she was rigidly built and did not relax too quickly into action. But the cousin who had been observing, with head alertly raised, interrupted. She cast a mischievous glance at John's wife. The empty chair was between them. For pity's sake, cried she, you ain't going to shove her off in the corner. Why? Here's this chair. She's the twelfth one. Here's where she ought to sit. There was a mixture of heartiness and sport in the young woman's manner. She pulled the chair back from the table. Come right over here, said she. There was a slight flutter of consternation among the guests. They were all narrow-lived country people. Their customs had made deeper grooves in their roads. They were more fastidious and jealous of their social rights than many in higher positions. They eyed this forlorn girl in her faded and dingy woolens, which fluttered airily and showed their pitiful thinness. Mrs. Child stood staring at the cousin. She did not think she could be in earnest, but she was. Come, she said, put some turkey in this plate, John. Why, it's just as the rest of you say, Mrs. Child said finally with hesitation. She looked embarrassed and doubtful. Say, why, they say just as I do, the cousin went on. Why shouldn't they? Come right around here. She tapped the chair impatiently. The girl looked at Mrs. Childs. You can go and sit down there where she says, she said slowly in a constrained tone. Come, called the cousin again. And the girl took the empty chair, with the guests all smiling stiffly. Mrs. Childs began filling a plate for the newcomer. Now that her hood was removed, one could see her face more plainly. It was thin, and of that pale brown tint which exposure gives to some blonde skins. Still, there was a tangible beauty that showed through all that. Her fair hair stood up softly, with a kind of airy roughness which caught the light. She was apparently about sixteen. What's your name? inquired the schoolmistress' sister suddenly. The girl started. Christine, she said after a second. What? Christine. A little thrill ran around the table. The company looked at each other. They were none of them conversant with the Christmas legends, but at that moment the universal sentiment of them seemed to seize upon their fancies. The day, the mysterious appearance of the girl, the name, which was strange to their ears, all startled them and gave them a vague sense of the supernatural. They, however, struggled against it with their matter-of-fact pride and threw it off directly. Christine what? Maria asked further. The girl kept her scared eyes on Maria's face, but she made no reply. What's your other name? Why don't you speak? Suddenly she rose. What are you going to do? I'd rather go i guess what are you going for 
You ain't had your dinner. I can't tell, whispered the girl. Can't tell your name? She shook her head. Sit down and eat your dinner, said Maria. There was a strong sentiment of disapprobation among the company, but when Christine's food was actually before her, and she seemed to settle down upon it like a bird, they viewed her with more toleration. She was evidently half-starved. Their discovery of that fact gave them at once a fellow feeling toward her on this feast day, and a complacent sense of their own benevolence. As the dinner progressed, the spirits of the party appeared to rise, and a certain jollity which was almost hilarity prevailed. Beyond providing the strange guest plentifully with food, they seemed to ignore her entirely. Still, nothing was more certain than the fact that they did not. Every outburst of merriment was yielded to with the most thorough sense of her presence, which appeared in some subtle way to excite it. It was as if this forlorn twelfth guest were the foreign element needed to produce a state of nervous effervescence in those staid, decorous people who surrounded her. This taste of mystery and unusualness, once fairly admitted, although reluctantly, to their unaccustomed palates, served them as wine with their Christmas dinner. It was late in the afternoon when they arose from the table. Christine went directly for her hood and shawl and put them on. The others, talking amongst themselves, were stealthily observant of her. Christine began opening the door. Are you going home now? asked Mrs. Childs. No, ma'am. Why not? I ain't got any. Where did you come from? The girl looked at her. Then she unlatched the door. Stop! Mrs. Childs cried sharply. What are you going for? Why don't you answer? She stood still but did not speak. Well, shut the door up and wait a minute, said Mrs. Childs. She stood close to a window, and she stared out scrutinisingly. There was no house in sight. First came a great yard, then wide stretches of fields. A desolate grey road curved round them on the left. The sky was covered with still low clouds. The sun had not shone out that day. The ground was all bare and rigid. Out in the yard some grey hens were huddled together in little groups for warmth. Their red combs showed out. Two crows flew up, away over the edge of the field. It's going to snore, said Mrs. Childs. I'm afeard it is, said Caleb, looking at the girl. He gave a sort of silent sob and brushed some tear out of his old eyes with the back of his hands. See here a minute, Maria, said Mrs. Childs. The two women whispered together. Then Maria stepped in front of the girl and stood tall and stiff and impressive. Now see here, she said. We want you to speak up and tell us your other name and where you come from and not keep us waiting any longer. I can't. They guessed what she said from the motion of her head. She opened the door entirely then and stepped out. Suddenly Maria made one stride forward and seized her by her shoulders, which felt like knife blades through the thin clothes. Well, she said, we've been fussing long enough. We've got all these dishes to clear away. It's bitter cold and it's going to snow and you ain't going out of this house one step tonight, no matter what you are. You'd ought to tell us who you are and it ain't many folks that would keep you if you wouldn't, but we ain't going to have you found dead in the road for our own credit. It ain't on your account. Now you just take these things off again and go and sit down in that chair. Christine sat in the chair, her pointed chin dipped down on her neck, whose poor little muscles showed above her dress, which sagged away from it. She never looked up. The women cleared off the table and cast curious glances at her. After the dishes were washed and put away, the company were all assembled in the sitting room for an hour or so. Then they went home. The cousin, passing through the kitchen to join her husband, who was waiting with his team at the door, ran hastily up to Christine. You stop at my house when you go tomorrow morning, she said. Mrs. Childs will tell you where it is, half a mile below here. When the company were all gone, Mrs. Childs called Christine into the sitting room. You'd better come in here and sit now, she said. 
I'm going to let the kitchen fire go down. I ain't going to get another regular meal. I'm just going to make a cup of tea on the sitting room stove by and by. The sitting room was warm and restrainedly comfortable with its ordinary village furnishings. Its ingrained carpet, its little peaked clock on a corner of the high black shelf, its red covered card table which had stood in the same spot for 40 years. There was a little newspaper covered stand with some plants on it before a window. There was one red geranium in blossom. Paulina was going out that evening. Soon after the company went she commenced to get ready and her mother and aunt seemed to be helping her. Christine was alone in the sitting room for the greater part of an hour. Finally, the three women came in and Paulina stood before the sitting room glass for a last look at herself. She had on her best red cashmere, with some white lace around her throat. She had a red geranium flower with some leaves in her hair. Paulina's brown hair, which was rather thin, was very silky. It was apt to part into little soft strands on her forehead. She wore it brushed smoothly back. Her mother would not allow her to curl it. The two older women stood looking at her. Don't you think she looks nice, Christine? Mrs. Childs asked, in a sudden overflow of love and pride, which led her to ask sympathy from even this forlorn source. Yes, ma'am. Christine regarded Paulina in her red cashmere and geranium flower with sharp, solemn eyes. When she was ready, when she really looked at anyone, her gaze was as unflinching as that of a child. There was a sudden roll of wheels in the yard. Willard's come, said Mrs. Childs. Run to the door and tell him you'll be right out, Paulina, and I'll get your things ready. After Paulina had helped her into her coat and hood, and the wheels had bowled out of the yard with a quick dash, the mother turned to Christine. My daughter's gone to a Christmas tree over to the church, she said. That was Willard Morris that came for her. He's a real nice young man that lives about a mile from here. Mrs. Child's tone was at once gently patronising and elated. When Christine was shown to a little back bedroom that night, nobody dreamed how many times she was to occupy it. Maria and Mrs. Childs, who, after the door was closed, set a table against it softly and erected a tiltish pyramid of milk pans to serve as an alarm signal in case the strange guest should try to leave her room with evil intentions, were fully convinced that she would depart early on the following morning. I don't know, but I've run an awful risk keeping her, Mrs. Childs said. I don't like her not telling where she's come from. Nobody knows, but she belongs to a gang of burglars and they've kind of sent her on ahead to spy out things and unlock the doors for them. I know it, said Maria. I wouldn't have her stay for a thousand dollars if it hadn't looked so much like snow. Well, I'll get up and start her off early in the morning. But Maria Stone could not carry out this resolution. The next morning she was ill with a sudden and severe attack of erysipelas. Moreover, there was a hard snowstorm, the worst of the season. It would have been barbarous to have turned the girl out of doors on such a morning. Moreover, she developed an unexpected capacity for usefulness. She assisted Paulina about the housework with timid alacrity, and Mrs. Childs could devote all her time to her sister. She takes right hold as if she was used to it, she told Maria. I'd rather keep her a while than not, if I only knew a little more about her. I don't believe but what I could get it out of her after a while if I tried, said Maria, with her magisterial air, which illness could not subdue. However, even Maria, with all her well-fostered imperiousness, had no effect on the girl's resolution. She continued as much of a mystery as ever. Still, the days went on, then the weeks and months, and she remained in the child's family. None of them could tell exactly how it had been brought about. The most definite course seemed to be that her arrival had apparently been the signal for a general decline of health in the family. Maria had hardly recovered when Caleb Childs was laid up with the rheumatism. Then Mrs. Childs had a long spell of exhaustion from overwork in nursing. Christine proved exceedingly useful in these emergencies. Their need of her appeared to be the dominant and only outwardly evident reason for her stay. Still, there was a deeper one which they themselves only faintly realised. 
this poor young girl, who was rendered almost repulsive to those honest downright folk by her persistent cloak of mystery, had somehow, in a very short time, melted herself, as it were, into their own lives. Christine, asleep of a night in her little back room, Christine of a day stepping about the house in one of Paulina's old gowns, became a part of their existence, and a part which was not far from the nature of a sweetness to their senses. She still retained her mild shyness of manner, and rarely spoke unless spoken to. Now that she was warmly sheltered and well fed, her beauty became evident. She grew prettier every day, her cheeks became softly dimpled, her hair turned golden, her language was rude and illiterate, but its very uncouthness had about it something of a soft grace. She was really prettier than Paulina. The two young girls were much together, but could hardly be said to be intimate. There were few confidences between them, and confidences are essential for the intimacy of young girls. Willard Morris came regularly twice a week to see Paulina, and everybody spoke of them as engaged to each other. Along in August, Mrs. Childs drove over to town one afternoon, and bought a piece of cotton cloth and a little embroidery and lace. Then some fine sewing went on, but with no comment in the household, Mrs. Childs had simply said, I guess we may as well get a few things made up for you, Paulina. You're getting rather short. And Paulina had sewed all day long with a gentle industry when the work was ready. There was a report that the marriage was to take place on Thanksgiving Day, but about the 1st of October, Willard Morris stopped going to the child's house. There was no explanation. He simply did not come as usual one Sunday night, nor the following Wednesday, nor the next Sunday. Paulina kindled her little parlour fire, whose sticks she had laid with maiden preciseness. She arrayed herself in her best gown and ribbons. When at nine o'clock Willard had not come, she blew out the parlour lamp, shut up the parlour stove and went to bed. Nothing was said before her, but there was much talk and surmise between Mrs. Childs and Maria and a good deal of it went on before Christine. It was a little while after the affair of Cyrus Morris's note, and they wondered if it could have anything to do with that. Cyrus Morris was Willard's uncle, and the note affair had occasioned much distress in the child's family for a month back. The note was for $2,500, and Cyrus Morris had given it to Caleb Childs. The time, which was two years, had expired on the 1st of September, and then Caleb could not find the note. He had kept it in his old-fashioned desk, which stood in one corner of the kitchen. He searched there a day and a half a night, pulling all the sealed, creasy old papers out of the drawers and pigeonholes before he would answer his wife's inquiries as to what he had lost. Finally, he broke down and told, I've lost the note of Morris's, said he. I don't know what I'm going to do. He stood looking gloomily at the desk with its piles of papers, his rough old chin dropped down on his breast. The women were all in the kitchen, and they stopped and stared. Thank you for listening to the Darkest Page podcast. This has been The Twelfth Guest, Part 1 by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman. This episode was made possible with the support of the librarians of the Darkest Page, Alex Smith and Tonks. I have been your host, and I wish you pleasant dreams. <laughs>